Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thanks a lot for uh, coming by. And uh, these are the times when we are kind of a little bit confused of uh, virtual versus the on-site. So but, but welcome and thank you for uh, coming here. And let's uh, welcome our uh, today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Jun Sun from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. J uh, Sun is a tenured professor in the University of Chicago, and uh, she is the expert of the gastroenterology and especially focused on the gut-brain axis. She is very well known uh, fellow for uh, this gut-brain axis uh, area. Um, she is also the elected fellow of the American Gastroenterological Association. She is also um, and and also fellow of the American Physiological Society. Um, Dr. Uh, Sun has completed her uh, master's degree in genetics from university from Wuhan University, and the PhD in uh, from Toxicology and Pharmacological Institute in China. And uh, Dr. Sun is uh, her program is mainly focused right now is on the vitamin D receptor signaling in the intestinal barrier function, and uh, uh, microbiome and inflammation in cancer, uh, as well as the microbiome in ALS, uh, and uh, looking at the microbiome uh, dysbiosis in the intestinal stem cells and how this microbiome and intestinal stem cells uh, interactions contribute in the cancer progression. <clears throat> and she is very well uh, funded by the NIH, DOD, uh, VA, and many other uh, foundations. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Sun for today's talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, great opportunity to visit uh, University of South Florida in person. And I really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is my first time after pandemic got to uh, uh, this uh, visiting professorship. And I am extremely excited because I got a chance to, to meet brilliant faculty uh, members in the past two days. And I'm very inspired by uh, what they are doing, what they have seen the growth of the university, and especially the, the, the energy for mentoring the, the next generation uh, in research. So it's quite exciting. And of course, I enjoy the weather and uh, delicious food here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And for me, because I uh, am trained as a genetic uh, a researcher and got my PhD in uh, biochemistry, but now I'm working on bacteria. So what I'm doing here? So that, uh, that's the interesting uh, change of the past, but not completely change of my uh, um, research training. And I want to share this uh, um, experience with uh, some of our trainees here in the room. And also uh, what we have found, uh, why we do this, what we find, what is the potential impact of what we're doing. And in 2003, when I was a junior faculty at the University of Chicago, uh, my best friend and also colleague, Dr. Uh, Michael Hobart, drew this cartoon for me. And we were so naive at that time because we defined our research as uh, innate immunity response and the host microbial interactions. At that time, there was not a very hard research on microbiome because the term already exists, but not a very active research. And we didn't know over years, and it comes with this uh, a, a huge hit. Uh, at the very beginning, it was advocated by pathologists, and later by a lot of gastroenterologists, because they are very interested in what happened in the microbiome in the GI, especially for those with say difficult infection, you have low cure, you have no medicine can help them. So then this microbiome concept was brought to the front of the medicine practice and also draw attention at NIH. So NIH started to put money and invest on a human microbiome HMP at that time was very descriptive. We look at the original plant-based to sequencing, sequencing everything they could find. And now we're not satisfied with, with just doing the sequencing. So we start to look at the, the, the causal role of a microbiome in the disease and with that understanding, we were able to move forward to really change the intervention to, for the prevention of the disease, for the therapeutic of the disease. 
So this is a very uh, a well-sighted uh, uh, figure because we are basically living with some invisible friends. And I would rather define them as an invisible newly discovered organ because it has the weight, the body weight, the, 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 the microbiome total weight, like several pounds, just like a human heart. It has its organization. It also has its unknown mechanism to regulate the host response with the other organs. And currently, we do have multiple things going on in the lab. Uh, we have this uh, vitamin D receptor story, try to understand how microbiome and microbiome and VDR contribute to inflammatory bowel disease and cancer, not just the breast cancer and also colon cancer. And we have an uh, ongoing study on AVRA, it's a salmonella protein. And what working on this for many years, try to link with the infection and chronic uh, disease such as colon cancer. And several of these studies actually was involved, especially during the pandemic. So we are able to pick up the non-COVID, so which after infection, patient has the change of the microbiome to understand what's going on for the non-run in the infectious disease. And for today's talk, I'm going to share some of our progress uh, in AOS. And what I'm going to do is just tell you a story. Why do we study the GI in AOS? And then I share some of our discovery, what we find, especially in the GI dysfunction and uh, dysbiosis in AOS. And the last, I share the progress and how our contribution changed the field in AOS. We look at this uh, uh, picture, and actually they are famous LS patients. And I don't know if you can recognize the first one, Chen Mao. And his death uh, reason was a political secret. Many Chinese uh, people didn't know it was die of LS. And the, in the middle is the famous uh, scientific feature, right? And he was the lucky one because he lived with LS for years and able to survive the disease uh, longer than many other AOS patients. And LS is also known as um, uh, no Gary's disease because of this famous New York uh, baseball player. And if you have chance to look at the YouTube, look at the farewell to his fine uh, when he was diagnosed with AOS, it was very touching. And he actually bring this disease to the global attention and people start to realize it's a very rare disease, but very desperately because we have no cure for this disease. And the progression of LS started with usually the muscle weakness and which indicate the damage of motor neurons. And eventually then lead to the death of the uh, motor neuron in the other organs. Of course, brain is also affected during the progression of the disease. Many of us uh, must know this uh, uh, ice bucket movement, and I bet some of you dumped the ice on yourself during that summer. And that was quite a social event in uh, 2014. And the LS uh, um, was starting to draw the attention from the public. And people realized, wow, this is a disease, and, and we didn't know what to do to cure the disease were very limited research uh, identified at that time. And actually our research uh, on LS started relatively earlier before the ice bucket movement, uh, started from a random conversation with a label uh, uh, in, in our lab, uh, just uh, close by and talk about whatever uh, model they were using. They told me they were using some SOD1 mutation. I said, did you look at the GI? I said, no, we don't look at GI because AS patient has no GI problem. And, and that made me wondering uh, what's going on in the model. So we start to, to look at that mouse model and happened we, we got this ice bucket challenge and it totally changed our uh, research direction. It's back to 2013. And I look at the ALS association. This is some uh, um, basic information about this disease. So, at any one time, about uh, 30,000 people uh, living with ALS in the US. 
compared to the cancer patients, to the chronic disease like allergy, like uh, colon cancer, it is not a huge number. But you could count, and each number, there is a family uh, behind it. There is a suffering, a struggling behind it. So it's, it's a no hope if we diagnose it with ALS. And many of them is because of the sporadic ALS. It's no reason. You didn't know what happened. Only 10% of them was uh, familiar because you know the whatever genetic mutation behind it. And the life risk for men and women is basically equal. And another striking fact is the military service. So military service is associated with the higher risk, two times higher than the regular population, regardless where they served during the wartime or during the peaceful time, which country they were sent to, no difference. But the risk was much higher. And that was quite striking. So I was lucky to send this uh, um, basic data to VA and able to get funding from VA because we want to help the military uh, staff to understand what's going on uh, in this disease. And at this moment, no effective treatment. The FDA approved the drug can only make patients live several months longer. That's it. The pathology of ALS could be simplified, and, and many of these things happened at the low limber. So start with the uh, muscle weakness, atrophy, and, and at the end of the day, because the patient basically uh, uh, didn't have the respiration, uh, and that, that was the cause of the death. But during this process, uh, I would say all the organs are involved. And that's one of the uh, patients you look at uh, all these um, organs, you could name it. It's not just a, a simple neuron muscular disease. And we have no idea what caused this uh, motor neuron death in ALS. We have no idea the neuron muscle crosstalk. And at that time, uh, back to 2014, no study on microbiome ALS. And of course, there is no study on gut brain access in ALS. So actually, I talked to my uh, neurologists. I talked to them and asked, how do you diagnose your patients? So, oh, it's difficult to diagnose. And usually we diagnose it and they have very few uh, years left. And there was no treatment. So basically, the only thing you could do is just to, to control the symptom. And so then I asked them, do you really notice any GI symptoms? I said, no, no. No GI symptom at all. Really? So then I talked to the ALS patients. What I heard is a very different story. And some of them actually were anxious to understand what happened to their body before when they were diagnosed with ALS. And I share this data with you. It's not just for data. I want to share the story behind it. When you look at this data, you're wondering, it's very simple, right? You, you just look at the microbiome at the final level, nothing else. It's a case report. You only have five patients, and the rest of them is just a healthy control cohort from, from the medical uh, company who did this sequence. So why I published this? I published this because I was having the difficulty to convince my neurologist colleagues to work with me. And they said, we don't deal with poop. -poo. And I was teaching said, oh, you only care things above your shoulder. You don't care things uh, on the rest part of the body. And that's because there is no jet symptom. And, and usually um, we don't look at that. And then, uh, so that, that means I, I have no problem. Uh, I have problem to really get IRB, right? Because you don't have people collect the samples uh, from the clinic. And then we, we got this uh, uh, patient. Basically, they, they are volunteer to do this medical analyze in the company, same company. So then they send the medical report to me. And I invite one of my GI colleagues, another uh, a neurologist, she is doing the alternative medicine, which was not considered as the mainstream in her field. So we basically work together to analyze this data. And then we draw the conclusion, see there is clear dysbiosis in this patient. 
because you already see at the thinner level, the difference of the of the of the microbiome compared to the the health population, and we also ask them to share the data of the GI uh, data on inflammation. So clearly show the GI inflammation in this patient. So then we published this uh, in the case report, and currently this paper was already signed 118 times. Consider this physiological report, the impact factor is um, two. <laughs> so we actually was quite happy because it's not about impact, it's about uh, how you can use your science knowledge to help the community, right? And the more I talk to my uh, AS patients, the more I feel like I have the obligation to really figure out what is going on here. Why is largely ignored? Are there really no reports on the AOS GI symptoms? So I invite one of my uh, students, she was doing a rotation in my lab. I said, Sarah, do you have interest in uh, literature searching? It's not just about bench work, because the, during the pandemic, everybody is, is doing the Zoom things, right? I said, I, I sign your uh, homework and also your rotation project. You did all the research and look at what is reported about AOS patient. Any GI symptoms? So she did that. And we searched the literature, the oldest back to the um, 1967. What we found is they all report on GI symptoms. So we did this publication uh, this year, and this is the, the table I summarized uh, in the publication. I will name the organs, and you can see pancreatic, liver, small intestine, large intestine, and they're all involved. Because of the ALS, it's just a small population. You will now see the huge study with hundreds of cohorts in, in, the, in the study, right? But you do see some of these were case reports, some of these with uh, uh, 18, 17 patients, which is it's large enough. Consider this is a, a relatively real disease, mass population. And we did see the problem of GI symptoms. At early diagnosis, after diagnosis, they have that. And we see the complaint from uh, AS patients about uh, what they eat, what they have at the very beginning. And I also see the case report from the literature. Um, AOS was misdiagnosed as celiac disease. What is celiac disease? Celiac disease is considered as the autoimmune disease and also very sensitive to gluten, right? And it was misdiagnosed as AOS. So that indicating the, uh, the gap of the knowledge in the field. One, largely ignore the GI symptom. Two, they don't have a very well-established method for diagnosis and, and don't talk about uh, treatment. So you, you even don't know how to diagnose it, right? And then from our side, because I'm a basic researcher, I'm not a clinician who really can help my patients. So what I could do, I think, okay, we do LS patients already have the GI symptom when they were diagnosed? So what about the early stage? Any symptoms in the LS? So we go back to the animal model. So try to look at early stage. So what we did, we use this LS animal model, which is translational with the human mutation, SOD1 G93A. It's a point mutation. And then this mice was used in the clinical trial for, for the LS and also efficiently recapitulated many features of human disease. So in these mice, we did a very simple study, two months, we drew the blood from the mice, so we measured the IL-17. Why we measured IL-17? Because it's considered as an inflammatory cytokine, right, increased. If you look at data, you don't look at title, you may saw this from IBD patients. So you see the, the increase of uh, IL-17. And what two months means? Two months means the animal haven't developed any symptom yet. So most of the time they develop the symptom uh, when they were reached 11, uh, um, uh, 110 days. So over three months. So two months is the pre-symptom. They already have this high inflammation. And then I searched the literature. I find the report from 2007. Uh, SLS, which means spontaneous the LS uh, uh, data analyzed, show increase of IL-17 and LPS in LS patients. 
So indicating nobody have some systematic information, but was ignored in the in the early stage in the literature. And then I look at the, the structure of the intestine because intestine is very important for the uh, innate immunity to protect the host from the other potential pathogen and the insult from the body. And what we did actually, we did a very uh, um, classical method which measured the uh, uh, inflammation, uh, the, um, the permeability. Is here. So the, what we show here, uh, you see the increase indicating the increase of the fluorescence. So which means more fluorescence went through the barrier system to the blood. So that indicated uh, the, the animal had the leaky gut. And to further show that we do a CO1 staining. So when it's a tight junction, usually at the apical sides of epicellular cells, it's a very beautiful uh, zinker, uh, uh, zipper staining, just like the Great Wall to line up here. And if you look at the mutation mice, the LS model, you see the structure was disrupted. And the total protein level is also reduced by doing the Western plot. So that indicates the GI permeability was already disrupted at the early stage, just two months old. And you see that. And the further we look at the penis cells, why we look at the penis cells? Penis cells usually stay in the small intestine, secrete a lot of antimicrobial peptide, which is very important for the innate immunity. And basically it considered as our own um, micro, uh, anti -micro uh, bacterial uh, uh, products, because you don't need uh, antibiotics from the physicians. Basically, uh, we have that naturally. And to measure this, usually we do the lysosome staining, a very beautiful red staining of lysosome at the bottom, indicating uh, the granule is very active. But look at this mutation. So you see that staining, indicating the penis cells are not normal. And also we look at the, uh, the some of these uh, antimicrobial peptides, um, Defensin 5 alpha, uh, uh, RIP3, and the others. And that indicating the product is also uh, reduced uh, in the pen cells. Of course, we did uh, sequencing to look at what is going on uh, in the profile. So we are able to uh, identify the difference uh, in the mice at the early stage before the symptom. Again, we uh, identified one of these changes related with field reproducing bacteria, and we also measured the, uh, the cone A transferase, the gene um, to, to produce the field rate was also reduced in the system. And of course, the, the GI symptom has a very important change. And one of the measurement is about the transit. So, the longer the transit, which means it's harder for the for the body to release the waste. So we did that uh, measurement, and we can see a uh, one month old slightly different, but almost no significant. And then two months, you already see the difference between these uh, uh, two groups, because the the longer means the uh, feces stayed longer in the in in the intestine and takes longer to release, and later three months, that's the very close to the symptom time. It's even harder to release. And sometimes my student had to stay in the animal facility just to wait them to release because we have a, a blue dye to label the, the feces. So you, you count how long it takes them to, to release. So take longer for them to observe. It's a very simple experiment, but it's very time consuming. So we use this uh, method, we're able to show the difference uh, at the physiological level in GI. We, we did some other markers for the muscle movement and also the uh, GFAT uh, for the uh, interneuron markers to show uh, after uh, one month, two months, three months, you did see the, this um, neuron uh, issue uh, is already shown. So much uh, later time, like three months, is more significant by looking at the protein level. And we did a, a immunostaining to visualize. This is uh, one of the representative picture to show the 
the loss of some uh, muscle, um, mice and protein. Uh, you see two months, this is three months, and um, white type, no change. And this is the, uh, the SOD1 AS model. You see it's reduced, but some of these mu muscles um, have no difference. So indicating uh, two months before the symptom, the GI symptom is already exists. And, and then we basically did very descriptive, but I think it's a necessary the descriptive study to show what's going on in the system. And from two to three months, and the most uh, uh, sensitive marker actually is just one month. You can see the change of the bacteria. This is a known uh, contributor to the immune response. Much earlier, one month you're able to identify. And later, uh, you see the SOD1 uh, aggregation, which is very common because I, I think each uh, neuron degenerative disease, you see some of this protein aggregation, right? And for ALS, uh, SOD1, uh, aggregation, not just only uh, in the brain, in the spinal cord, but also see that in the in the uh, intestine, small intestine and the colon. And three months, uh, so all these symptoms before came, so you already see the change at a different level. And then we ask what we can do to help them. Because my training is very simple because we did a lot of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, infectious disease treatment, and said, can I use the method just uh, like we treat IVD? So that's what I did. So we just put the butyrate, it's a bacterial product, fermentation product, uh, in the water, 2%, let them drink. And very simple, right? Yeah. And this result was amazing. This uh, after drinking uh, the Butyrate, two percent, and you can see this is the treated one. Usually they cannot pass 150 days, and this one with drinking they can pass the 180 days. And I remember the technician was so uh, surprised about the data, and she said maybe I did something wrong with the genotyping. <laughs> and then she came back to the lab, redo the genotyping, make sure nothing wrong with the genotyping. It's not problem with the genotyping is the rescue of this uh, butyrate treatment. And butyrate actually is known and beneficial for, for inflammatory bowel disease, but this is the first time we identify the beneficial of uh, butyrate in the ALS mice by putting in the drinking water. It's not IV, it's not IP, just put in the water. And, and think about the lifespan, we could extend them for 38 days average and if you convert these 38 days of um, a mouse lifespan to human life, your times three, so indicating you have 1,000 days, you could help the patient to live longer. And, and that, that was very encouraging. So that's why when we published data, I got a lot of response, not from the neurologist, from AS patient and the family members. They wrote to me, they asked uh, Dr. Sam, where can we got these supplements? What is those to be used? I said, I'm sorry, I'm under research. I'm not supposed to tell you how to use the supplement or medicine, but they did give them the, the, the very positive um, message. It's, it's possible to, to change the GI symptoms. And we also measured the, uh, the road red test to show the muscle strength, and, and we did see um, with the beauty treatment, they could uh, stay uh, longer, indicating the strength of the muscle. And we also measure the, the ZO1 protein, as you uh, know, this is important for the tight junctions. And after beauty treatment, it was enhanced. And this is one of the treatment to show the uh, uh, GFAP uh, interneuron uh, uh, marker. It was uh, suppressed after the uh, treatment. Another interesting thing is because uh, uh, most of the research only worry about the neuron uh, um, SOD1 aggregation uh, in the in the cells, and actually we see a very amazing uh, uh, change in the small intestine because if you have this beauty treatment, you're able to clean up some of this aggregation. We can stand out this uh, aggregation because this is a human transgenic mice. So you use a human antibody, so you can see the aggregation. And after butyl treatment, the, the dot was reduced very significantly. 
it happens. And also we see the, some of these beauty producing bacteria will stimulate after the treatment, which makes sense because uh, the beauty treatment will change the, the micro environment, make some of these beneficial bacteria to, to, to function better. And this is a recent study. If you have interest in the data, and and you can go back to the to the paper we published in Gut Microbes, and we basically have this summary to show if we're able to manipulate the microbiome in multiple methods. We did the beauty treatment, we did the antibiotic treatment. Actually, we also have co-housing study. The reason we did that is we want to show different methods to manipulate the microbiome. Could we make the animal live longer? Could we delay the symptom? If we protect the GI, could we protect the, the ALS progression and slow down? I'm not saying this uh, method will be a miracle method to completely treat the disease, but at least uh, for this challenging disease, we can live and make these uh, patients live a relatively uh, better life quality and slow down the disease progression. So mechanism behind this, because I'm a researcher uh, always looking at why. So this is uh, uh, one of the reasons, as already mentioned, because uh, butyl treatment is able to clean up the aggregation in the colon. And we we'll also see the reduction of uh, aggregation uh, of SOD1 uh, in the spinal cord, in the neurons. Uh, this is the data from the small intestine. And we have data to show um, if we do that in vitro, can we really reduce that? And basically, we did this uh, fluorescence, uh, SOD1, and show in the culture system, it's a human intestinal epithelial cells. And after uh, butyl treatment, you see the uh, aggregation was reduced. And then go back to literature. I was always wondering why uh, the ALS had no role uh, in in this GI Wodeltary study, and I was happy to see this uh, GEM uh, research uh, in 2016. They have this interesting conclusion to tell uh, um, us about the importance of some antioxidants, fruits, vegetables, or associated with the, the highest functional uh, the baseline. So if you ask any GI practitioner or GI researcher, they will say, this is about probiotics because you eat fruits, you eat vegetables to promote good bacteria, right? But however, in the ALS fields, there is no further extension back to 2016. Because the talk, food is just food. <laughs> the health rate, but they, they, they really haven't extended why you give this recommendation to your patients. You, you eat vegetables, eat fruits, and sometimes it may be hard for them to digest because many of these patients are on tubes, right? And you didn't ask why. So I think what we find here is important for the field because we know why. We know the GI symptom was early. We know they, they have difference of the microbiome. We know if we could provide some of these fermentation uh, products to the patient, they may provide the protection, not just from the energy side, and also to clean up some of these jacks. And this is what we see. Uh, this is by the current literature. And I'm so happy to see many of our urologists, the colleagues, change their mind. Now they are starting to deal with poop. -poop. And there is already, uh, already 11 research papers reporting the dysbiosis in human LS. Remember our case report was so tiny, right? Just five patients. Mm -hmm. So now they're able to recruit some of these studies uh, over 50, 50 patients. And a smarter design and a recent study, they recruit a uh, uh, spouse, family members as a control to, to eliminate some potential environment uh, effect. And they find the difference of microbiome in the ALS patient. And the clinical trials are using butyry in the ALS patient. And they also combined FDA approved drugs with butyrate for the clinical trial. And the other ongoing research clinical trials is fecal microbial transplantation, which is a, another step forward to change the microbiome in this ALS patient. So they're all ongoing study after five years. 
when we were had a hard time at that time back to five years ago to even convince a collaborator to collect the proof of us. And now we see the huge change in the field. And I think that's the value for basic research. Because you know why, you understand the how, and you see the change in the field. The change will not happen overnight. Uh, we had a lot of difficult time, very frustrated and, and very disappointed. Because you can imagine when you submit the paper, you're so excited and said, no junk, and they, they rejected you. And so that kind of uh, effort, I think definitely worth it. Because I, I see the, uh, the very positive feedback. It's not from the research field. I saw that from the AS population, from the uh, community, because I got a very close interaction with them. Some of them wrote to me. Some of them did a lot of literature search for me. Because they look at MS, look at Parkinson's, look at the other diseases, and they hope somebody could draw attention to the progress in the field to so start to, to look at the AOS. So this is what we know. AOS is a difficult disease. Basically, all the organs are related, and as a very humble, very baby steps we did, we're able to contribute to the field, try to understand what is going on in the GI, what is going on in the uh, microbiome. And hopefully with the, the ongoing study, because we know uh, currently the medical study basically is teamwork. So you got to work together, really understand how difficult this disease is and, and really help the patient for the long run. And remember this famous saying, I'm not saying that the GI is the most important thing, the gut is most important, but th this uh, old wisdom is still uh, applied to today's medical uh, practice and the research. That's why we have multiple things going on, as I just mentioned at the beginning. We're not just look at the local microbiome uh, difference, we look at the the distant interactions because microbiome is not just about the community, it's also about the products because they can release a uh, uh, metabolize, they can stimulate the host to get some inflammation and then change the behavior of the other organs, including brain, including liver and breast and the others, and also the heart. And how to stop that? I think the same reason. If you're able to make your microbiome happy, to make them healthy, the chance to stop an lot of chronic disease will be much better at the early stage, right? Because with the prebiotics, which means you give them the good things to start with, probiotics, it's good bacteria, because unfortunately good bacteria are not very competitive to survive. So you've got to give them again and again and change the dietary, it's the, the di lifestyle is very different now. And you got to be very careful about what kind of food you choose and fecal transplantation. And now even better because some of these uh, super donor microbiome was peered uh, in, the, in the capital. So you just uh, take it as, as, uh, as a medicine. And so what is excitement happened over the past decades? I think the the field actually was very excited and, and I shared the excitement. I also did a lot of uh, um, uh, editing, writing things. These are books published from my group and I want to uh, thank all the authors contribute to the writing to share the, the knowledge. And the, I think I want to highlight this book, uh, which was uh, uh, Read actually with my husband and his colleague because they, uh, my husband actually is very lucky. He was uh, invited to give a talk here virtually last year on microbiome data analysis. <laughs> and I said, uh, leave the chance for both of us get invited by the same center. It's not, it's not very high, right? And I'm the luckiest one because I was able to come to the site to meet people in person. And his book was uh, um, downloaded uh, 65,000 times, uh, which I think is quite uh, uh, satisfied as a professional book. And currently, we hope we have the capacity to uh, merge the omic data because we have all kinds of omics now. And we want to merge all this data to really understand what is going on. So have a, a, a 
the data uh, which can really make sense if you go to the clinic. Because if you show all this data to your physician colleagues, they basically get a headache. They cannot take your words very seriously. But if you can dissect, make it simplified uh, and present to them, it will be more feasible to use in the clinic practice. And for the conclusion, I think uh, I just want to share with you today uh, with one uh, disease to show uh, the importance of microbiome and show the, the change of GI, uh, therefore change the, the view of how we treat the disease, how we diagnose the disease. And eventually, I hope our basic research, um, ALS and the microbiome could contribute to the, to the field. And I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my team and also funding agents. And I have special thanks to the ALS patient and their family members, especially for a, a, a memory for a dog or what. And she actually passed away uh, last month. And I appreciate her knowledge and her passion to help the community as an ALS uh, patient. So a lot of thanks, a lot of story behind the science. And I think as a basic researcher, our effort was it because at the end of the day, our point is to help people to do the discovery, to change the, the society for a better way. Thank you for your attention. I can take questions. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and and then I'll I miss your part regarding your SOD one the ninety three A mutant looks like it's a human SOD one mutant you put in the mouse right yeah I didn't do that it was uh, made by a professor uh, last name Dan yeah he did that but based on your Western data looks like they not interact. The endogenous SOD1 in the mouse. No, because endogenous, you have your Y type. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, what, that's why I want to say what's the mechanism by which this kind of human mutant SOD1 bother intestinal integrity. Looks like clearly, and then beautiful treatment can significantly rescue this kind of integrity. What's the mechanism? Why the buterin can make the SOD 93 mutant so dramatic rescue this kind of intestinal? Everything. Yeah, that's a good question because the builder is known uh, in the GI field with multiple functions. Number one, it could be a supplement of energy. It's on daily basis, we got a lot of uh, energy from fermentation by bacteria, and the builder is one of these uh, uh, products. And I think energy, because AOS is also considered as energy dysfunction disease, right? And one reason. The another reason is. Uh, Beauty is also considered as h deck inhibitor, so it could manipulate the transcription of some genes at the molecular level. And tight junctions such as zero one and the other junctions, they have this uh, h uh, um, uh, h deck inhibitor regulation mechanism. And uh, go beyond that, uh, and Beauty also uh, provide uh, the the support for cell proliferation. Multiple mechanism behind it, and why SOD one aggregation was uh, uh, clean up. I think we haven't had a, a clear mechanism at this moment. Yeah, but definitely something directly from building because in the culture model we saw the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Please. <laughs> the back seat. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sam, for your presentation. Uh, you know, I work over 20 years in the US, including patients. Uh, my question is uh, because patients in mid stage or later on uh, develop constipation, and also genetically free any mice, some of them. Also, develop constipation. Can you describe as your as your parents or your students' weight when this you know come out whatever? But constipation in patients is already known. Why? It's my question related is for your microbiome data. 
Of course, different kinds of behavior fall inside, in GI, you know, because this microbiome can be changed uh, from beginning disease to end disease. Do you have data on patients or even animals? You showed from three months, three months genetically, mice, years, you're a symptomatic mice. No symptoms. Three months they start to develop symptoms. Yes, yeah. Yes, you're the symptomatic person. And compare this data. So, what is microbiome? During disease progression, it's one question. And also, how is this related to um, good bacteria? Ratio of bad bacteria, which have to be focused on. For this disbalance between good and bad bacteria, you know, then is or how this response cross constitution, you know, and then can be changed microbiome during this event, you know, how to be, or if you treat it, then actually. I'm interested in it. I hear this mechanism for the great treatment way. How is this treatment occur? And I did not see any data on mutanials and mice. How is this your treatment? The risk of mutanials, yes, of spin increase, is this progression delayed, but I'm interested in how mutanials respond to your treatment. Yeah, let me uh, uh, try to recapitulate your questions because your question is about will the um, patients with uh, a constipation uh, really show the difference of good bacteria and bad bacteria? And then further, can we manipulate the microbiome to really help them to release this uh, constipation, right? Because this is known in ALS patient. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I think the, the first question, for ALS patients, usually they believe because they already under tubes, they have less fibers taken, and, and, and also the muscle uh, movement was weaker. So then uh, it's much easier for them to take longer to really got this transit uh, time for the waste. And what we try to uh, follow up, because I showed the data uh, for the three months, actually, if the mice really develop a symptom, the constipation is even worse because it takes longer for, for them really to, to release the, the waste. And it is known, uh, not just for uh, ALS patients, for those with GI symptoms, because uh, the IBS, uh, IBS uh, also known, you can manipulate the microbiome, so therefore to release the GI symptom. It's known in the, in the GI uh, practice. And which one uh, will be more beneficial, because there is only also debate. Because individually, we, we do have our fingerprint of our own microbiome. So uh, it's very different. Uh, maybe work will work for one patient, may not that will work for the others. And that's the challenge for the field too. So you, you cannot have a universal one string just uh, for everything, right? So it's very challenging to really identify which bacterial string could be beneficial to help the patient to release the symptom. So that's the challenge. What we did actually, we took the shortcut because we took the final products, Buildery, we knew it was beneficial. So we you just gave to the, to the in, in our case, because we gave to the animals, we did say it helped them to, to release the waste. As you treat oral? Yes, oral, yeah. Water, right? Yeah, just in the water, they, they, they can freely drink it. We, we monitor the, the water amount. That, that's the things we did. May not be accurate, say, individual or mouse, how much they drink right, on daily basis, but uh, at least the, the overall outcome is helpful. Yeah, we don't give the other water, just the, the building in the water. Yeah. But, you know, I still not sure about your target in microbiome. You say challenge in this disease, if you find out in what specific bacteria is lead or constipation or lead dysfunction of microbiomes that can be targeted, correct? 
Or? Yeah, that, that could be uh, identified because as I already mentioned at the end of the talk, 11 clinical trial uh, is already going on. Uh, and also the uh, research on the uh, human samples, because mouse were different from the, the human, right? Because we know the difference. And especially for a human, we, we took different kind of uh, food, different lifestyle. And so I think that will make sense for us really go to the clinic look at the patients with the constipation and then look at what make the difference uh, with the microbiome and actually if it's possible just use the super donor use the donor who have the the good one to to help them to release the symptom yeah i only use the sod one but uh, if you look at the recent literature there is other uh, model um, uh, T, uh, TP43, we have data, we haven't published that. And another new model, uh, they identify another mutation, they publish in Nature, uh, and I think it starts with C, I forgot the full name. It's also a point of mutation in human. They also show the uh, difference of microbiome in the mice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, enjoy your presentation. Thank you. Uh, one question I had was about IO-17. Early on, you saw that there was significant change in IO-17 labels. Yes. So, with the treatment, uh, do you see, did you measure on the, the IO-17 labels, making it up? Or? Yes, we did it. We, we measured the whole panel of information, uh, including TF, ARGA, LPS, and, and, and IO-17. I put L17 here because there was no increase in the LS patient. <clears throat> and the other cytokines actually uh, was uh, reduced because of veterinary treatment. And the explanation in the field, because uh, there is an ongoing study in the uh, neural inflammation in LS. So the interpretation was slightly different because they believe this is uh, 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 related with the neural inflammation. And we interpret it in the, in the, in the, in the relatively uh, different way because when you talk about LPS, we're usually uh, related to bacteria because otherwise, how could you get LPS in the blood, right? Either you have blood, uh, 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 you know, translocation of bacteria in the blood. Otherwise, the LPS should be very low in the blood. Yeah. I was curious, have you looked at to see if there's any overlap and like change in file with this disease compared to other diseases? Is there any similarity between you know, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease changes, and the changes that you see here? I haven't looked at the other diseases, but I know Parkinson's disease and uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease, they are more uh, active looking at the microbiome uh, uh, in, in the field, especially for Parkinson's. Because Parkinson's disease, the, the, there is all early sign of GI difference. Yeah, and the LS uh, relatively uh, less studied. Yeah, but I think many of these general uh, concept could be used in in different diseases. Sorry, on this part of your presentation, I don't know if you covered this, but in my experience of reading literature with animal studies of other disease models that. The, the benefits of increasing drug change and acid production to the zero rate are greater by giving a prebiotic rather than giving the short chain fatty acid itself, like zero rate. Has that been your experience? You, you're talking about the, uh, the short chain fatty acid the mixture, right? Or, well, or the I'm different saying, route that by uh, injection or? Would be better to give a prebiotic that boosts production oh, of acids than to give butyrate itself. Directed it, right? You agree with that? That that would be more efficacious. That's my what I've observed in the literature. I, I will say that uh, in the relatively conservative way depends because think about if, if the jungle is the microbiome. You can consider this as an invisible uh, jungle, right? So big trees, small trees, bushes, uh, mushrooms, and grass. And if that whole uh, ecology system was very damaged, and it's very hard to, to fix them just with uh, uh, um, prebiotics, you need to bring the stream back, or just gave the final products, like butyrate, like the other short fatty acids, to, to stop it getting worse. 
But for now, not to give the lifestyle course prebiotics, I think will will. Well, will that's the point. Again. Even better would be to use a symbiotic, a combination of both. Exactly, and this is a very active field, especially for industry, because they start to realize there is no miracle just with one stream, one chemical pump, pump mm -hmm. but it's much better to, to have cocktails. The mixture products of bacteria strain, which can constantly provide products, but also with some beneficial uh, metabolites right in the products. <clears throat> And then that may have one follow up question, and that is in your microbiome analysis, do you examine the yield of microorganisms? <laughs> yes, and, and we haven't exactly looked at the concept but because my good friend, Dr. Li uh, Ping okay. he, he's a big pusher for the, right. for the field. Yeah, and I, uh, I think his he, theory actually makes sense because right. we know that in the same family, you may have some black sheep, right, in the family. Right. Even everybody looks the same, and 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 for this bacteria, it's hard to just define them. Oh, this is the strain level; everybody will be good, or this is the family level; everybody is bad. So you you may have some uh, the uh, they call the great. They 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 just uh, work together as as a community or as a group, and it will be cross the the family and the species level. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I, I may have missed the point, uh, but uh, you you show the effect on the aggregation of SOD uh, mutants in the intestine. But is it the only place where you have looked for the effect of butyrate on the aggregation? In other words, do you think that this effect is really only in the intestine, or it is a general effect on the protein? We look at the SOD1 in the classical uh, location because the, most of the research usually look at the spinal cord. Sure. Yeah, so that was cleaned up. Okay, now this is what I mean. So mm -hmm. really you have this effect on the aggregation in all the target tissues of the, of the disease. I haven't looked at the other tissues. I look at the spinal cord, look at the brain, look at the uh, intestine, but not in the other tissues. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And. You focused on the uh, butyrate, which is, which makes sense, of course. But I mean, would you exclude that you have other metabolites which are involved? And are you looking for this? That's, that's a good question. And actually, uh, uh, there is a recent publication. They identified uh, uh, vitamin B as uh, one of the uh, beneficial uh, metabolites. Uh, and actually, when the paper was published, I was contacted by the reporter saying that uh, and they didn't see that product was uh, better than butyrate. And I said um, uh, the integration could be we need to try multiple metabolites rather than one metabolite. Because mm -hmm. the reason I did that was totally by chance because I using my training in uh, informative about disease uh, background. To, to apply to ALS. But if we go further, I, I think um, we should identify more metabolites and basically we could combine them to see the synergetic uh, uh, protection. And we have something going on because we, we already did the uh, metabolite analyze on, on targeted methods, so no bells, so we, we know which one could be beneficial. We'll publish that very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do have some questions. I need to talk. Yeah, we can talk. Yeah. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Very you. Nice. Thank you. Very nice talk. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. now,